Welcome to our lecture on the normal distribution. If you uh, looked at the lecture on probability distributions in general, you'll remember that for any continuous probability distribution, and the normal distribution is an example of that, uh, the um, probability distribution is actually a curve. It's called a probability density function. Uh, the probability that uh, x, our random variable, is equal to any one particular value must be zero because it's a continuous random variable. The probability that it takes on any one value is so minuscule um, that the probability of it taking on that value is zero. Um, we're talking about a continuous random variable that can take on any value um, including fractional decimal values inside of an interval. So we talk about intervals. What's the probability uh, that the random variable will take on a value between 0 and 1, let's say? So we ask probability questions. We frame them in terms of intervals. Um, in addition, we talk about the probability as the area under the curve, because um, if you see the shaded area in the curve on the slide, um, if we're looking at the probability that the random variable will take on a value like that in that interval, let's say that interval is between 0 and 1, um, it's, if we can get the sum, the area in that interval, the area under the curve, that would be a definite integral, and then we can get the area under the entire curve, divide one by the other, we get the proportion of times that the random variable takes on a value inside that interval. Well, a proportion is equal to a probability. And so that's how we get our probability. Of course, uh, you, you'll also remember that the way the formulas uh, for the continuous uh, probability distributions, the way the formulas are constructed, uh, the area, the total area under the curve is equal to one. So if we want to take, um, the area under the curve that's shaded in and divide by the total area, that's just dividing by one and it makes our lives a little bit easier. Let's look at some of the properties of the normal distribution, the famous bell-shaped curve. Okay, the three key characteristics. One, it's symmetric about the mean. That means on the right side of the mean, it looks exactly the same as the left side. So the symmetry here. Also, you can see the highest point is right in the center. The mean equals the median equals the mode. That's why it's called a bell-shaped curve. And finally, fx, as you move further and further away from the mean, fx gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the same as the right as the left. And um, the way we show that is x goes from plus infinity to minus infinity. It's asymptotic. It means it's getting closer and closer to the uh, horizontal axes, but never quite touches it. This is another way of understanding that uh, if IQ is normally distributed, let's say it's a, 100 is the mean. You have very few people who are going to have IQs of over 150, and very few who have IQs below 50. You know, the bulk is always going to be near the 100. What you see here is the formula that produced that curve, that bell-shaped curve for the normal distribution for the uh, probability density function. Um, I like to uh, scare my students when I teach in class. So I can't do it here because you'll figure it out in a minute. I like to say, oh, yes, we're going to use that formula and we're going to use a calculus. You'll have to do integrals. And um, yeah, so it's not going to work here. But um, basically, I do want you to look at it. You're never going to use the formula again, thankfully. Everything we need has been tabulated for us, and we're going to be able to look up uh, normal probabilities in a table. We'll see how very shortly. Uh, but do take a look at it. That, um, that curve is the, the, uh, the y value for any particular x value, any value of the random variable x. It computes f of x. f of x is the relative frequency. Um, so it has to be relative frequency, again, because we know the probability that x is equal to any particular value, right, is zero. We can only look at uh, values inside of intervals if we're looking at probabilities. Um, but that's not really the most important thing. The most important thing is to know that there is a curve, 
um, and if we have the right information, every particular uh, normal distribution can be um, drawn. You can do it yourself. You can do it with a computer program. Um, look at the formula. What do we have? We've got a lot of constants, right? We've got 1, we've got 2, we've got pi, we've got e. Uh, the, those are all constants. We've got a random variable, x. That's the random variable. What's left? The only thing, things that are left that are not constants and not the random variable itself are mu and sigma. These are the parameters of the normal distribution. Mu is the average of the normal distribution that you're working with. Sigma is the standard deviation. Remember from the very first lecture, mu and sigma are parameters of the population. Uh, for every mu and sigma combination, we have another normal distribution. Every normal distribution is characterized by a particular value of mu and a particular value of sigma. So really, there are an infinite number of normal distributions. Um, how are we going to use one uh, table to, to help us uh, compute probabilities from the normal distribution we're interested in? Well, we're going to see that shortly. Okay, as you've been told, there are infinite normal distributions. You can create your own. There are programs that will do it for you. And the program will ask you, give me the mu and give me the sigma. And you can say mu is 12.67 and sigma is 3.99. It'll draw you a normal distribution. The, and you know it's symmetric, you know the properties. There's only one we call Z. That's the standard uh, standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution has a mu of zero and a sigma of one. And that's why you have a Z table. It's essentially showing you, it's like our template, and that shows you what the normal distribution looks like if mu is zero and sigma is one. And by the way, because of that property, you can transform any normal distribution. You could be working with, doesn't matter what you're working with, as long as you, you know it's normal uh, normal distribution, you could transform it so that you can use that Z table using the formula Z equals X minus mu over sigma. That's called, we discussed this already early in the course, standardizing the data. And this way you don't never need to use calculus uh, in this course. Instead you use the template. What's the template? The Z distribution, the standard normal distribution. We're going to look at the uh, normal distribution, the standard normal distribution, the Z, and see how to read this table. Very important. So maybe one of the most important things you can learn is how to read the Z table. It's quite easy. Okay, look at the table. And suppose you want to know how much area do you have from 0 to 1. In other words, Z is going to be 1. How much area do you have from 0 to 1? By the way, it'll be the same answer for 0 to minus 1. It's the same as 0 to plus 1. Let's say you don't have negatives here. It's the same thing. It's symmetric. Let's do 0 to plus 1. Okay, now look at the, it's not really a column. See, underneath the Z, you see a 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Those are row headings. So now you want to know from 0 to 1. It's actually 1.00. So you go down, and then you look at the row headings. Underneath the Z, look at the 1.0. Now you want the second decimal place. The second decimal place comes from those columns on top, where it has 0 0.00, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. That's your second decimal place. So if you want to know how much area is there between 0 and 1.00, you see it's highlighted, it's circled, 0 0.3413, 0 0.3413. If I ask you how much area between 0 and minus 1, ignore the sign. It's symmetric. So it's the same answer, 0 0.3413. In other words, how much area do they have between 0 and 1? 34.13% 34, 34 of the population will be between 0 and plus 1 standard deviation away. How much between 0 and minus 1? Also 0.3413. We're going to study how to use this uh, Z table. Now first, before I even get to a particular problem, if I ask you how much area between 0 and infinity, the answer is half. I would say from zero to minus infinity is a half because the area under the whole curve is one. So those numbers in that table, the four decimal places, you could see it as a proportion or a probability. So suppose you're asked, what is the probability or area from zero to 1.28? You got to find one, zero is the middle. 
Remember, this is the z table. The mean is zero. That's why there's a zero in the middle. Now, how do you find from zero to 1.28? Now, look at, but actually, the first column that has a z, those are the row headings. Okay, think of that as row headings. Think of the numbers uh, that actually are the uh, columns. That's the second decimal place. So it's 0 0.00, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Point, that's where you re read the second decimal place. So from 0 to 1.28, first you go to the row heading underneath the Z of 1.2. Okay, you don't have the H yet. We need to get that extra 8. Well, you go to the column that has 0 0.08. See that column has 0.08, and you look at 1.2, and where they intersect, that's 1.28. And you see the answer is 0.3997. That's a probability or a proportion. So the answer is, what is the area from 0 to plus 1.28? 0.3997. And guess what? If you need to get minus 1.28, you don't need another table, because it's symmetric. So 0 to minus 1.28, will also be 0.3997, or almost 40% of the area is between 0 and 1.28. Let's do another problem. How about 0 to 0.87? Okay. So again, you look at the Z, the row headings. Underneath Z, you go to 0 0.8. Now we need the second decimal place. By now, you figure it out. You're going to get that second decimal place from the column that has 0.07. That's your second decimal place. So that's where 0.87 is, and notice it's circled for you. There's your answer. How much area do you have from 0 to 0 0.87? 0 0.3078, or 30.78% of the area of the curve is between 0 and 0 0.87. Now we're asking you to figure out how about 0 to minus 0 0.87. Think about it. You'll know the answer. Let's do an example. We're going to take a uh, weight, the weight of adult males. Suppose we know that the weight of adult males is normally distributed with a mean mu of 150 pounds and a standard deviation sigma of 10 pounds. That's a particular normal distribution. Now the question is, what's the probability that a randomly selected male will weigh between 140 pounds and 155 pounds. Now notice we have an interval because we know that that's the only way that we can ask probability questions for a continuous random variable. Um, now we do have the standard normal distribution tabulated so that we can look things up, but how do we get the probabilities for a normal distribution with a particular mean and a particular standard deviation, uh, not normal, not standard normal. Um, it's the, the standard normal, the mean would be zero and the standard deviation would be one. That's not what we have here. That's um, basically what the solution is all about. Let's take a look at the solution. Now you see a picture of the normal distribution you're going to see that repeatedly, practically all throughout the semester, and not just because we like to make pretty pictures. Uh, you must do the same thing when you solve your problems. Uh, anytime you're looking for um, a probability from the normal distribution, draw the picture. The very first thing you do, draw the picture. It's almost impossible to answer questions correctly, certainly not every single time, uh, without drawing the picture. Don't be lazy. Don't try to speed things up by not drawing a picture. You will be sorry and you'll have to do things all over again. You'll end up wasting time. Uh, let me tell you what I do. I've been doing this a long time, right? Every time I have to do a problem, I draw the picture. Uh, so here we have um, the picture of the distribution in question. Uh, mu is 150. So you see mu is at the 50% mark, right? Uh, the distribution, as always, since it's a normal distribution, is symmetric about the mean. Uh, the right side is 50%, the left side is 50%, and each side is the mirror image of each other. But what are we asking for? What we're asking for is the probability, the area in the interval between 140 pounds and 155 pounds. 
So in essence, uh, we're looking at two different non-overlapping areas. Why? Because we want to use the z-table uh, that gives us the uh, area under the curve between zero and z, the z-table the z uh, that we've been working with uh, that has the blue shaded area in the picture on the top. Um, so for every z value in the table, um, you can you can get the area under the curve between zero and it. All right. So we have to work with what we can get. We can't in one step get the area between 140 to 155 pounds. Well, we could if we wanted to use calculus and work with the formula that was uh, up a few slides ago. But if we don't have to, and if we don't want to, then let's not, huh? Um, so we have one piece of the distribution between 140 and 150 on the left side of the mean, one piece of the distribution between 150 and 155 pounds on the right side of the mean. But again, now we have the problem of not having this particular normal distribution tabulated. However, as we know, we can transform any normal distribution into a standard normal. We have the formula to do that. So what we want to do is uh, translate this picture from an X distribution to a Z distribution. And that's why you see the additional scale that was drawn under the X, OK? Um, on the left-hand side, you see the formula. We want to transform the 140 into a Z. So Z is equal to 140 minus 150 in the numerator divided by 10, 10 was the standard deviation, um, and the result is negative 1, and that's why there's a negative 1 on the z-scale underneath lining up with the 140. So the area under the curve between 140 and 150 is the same as the area under the curve in the z-distribution between 0 and negative 1. And when we look that up in the z-table, we find an area of 0.3413. In fact, I think we saw that in a, for a different problem a minute or so ago. On the right side, we want to standardize that 155, turn it into a Z. Uh, Z is, into one, is equal to 155 minus 150 divided by 10. And we end up with 1 half, 0.5 for the Z value. And you see the 0.5 on the z scale underneath the x, uh, underneath the x of 155. And so again, the area under the curve in the x distribution between 150 and 155 is exactly the same as the area under the curve between a z value of 0 and a z value of 0.5. And when you look that up in the table, you see that that value is 0.1915. It's important to note that these are non-overlapping areas. They're, th because of that, they're mutually exclusive, and we can add them. We can use the adding rules, the rules of addition of probabilities. 3413 plus 1915 gives you 0.5328 for the answer to the question. And so the probability that an individual male chosen at random will weigh between 140 and 155 pounds. That probability is 0.5328, or in other words, 53.28% of the population will be in that area. And here's another problem. Um, say, say we know that IQ is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 10. What percentage of the population will have A, IQs ranging from 90 to 110, B, IQs ranging from 80 to 120? Um, what's the first thing you have to do? Always, always, always draw a picture. Uh, take a look at the picture that's there. Uh, you're going. This is the same kind of picture you're going to be drawing all throughout the, this topic and other topics too. We've got a picture of the normal distribution, the original one, the X, 
Uh, we've got a Z-scale drawn under it uh, for part A. And remember, if you have a multiple part problem, you draw another picture for each one. And take my word for it. If you think you'll be saving time by not doing that, you're actually going to be wasting time because you'll eventually have to go back and start the whole thing all over again. Um, so the area we're gonna, where we have to standardize the 90 and the 110 for, for part A, it's much like the problem we did before, um, where we've got non-overlapping pieces, we're gonna be looking at the piece between uh, 90 and 100 on the X distribution, and um, we're going to be looking at the piece between 100 and 110 on the x distribution. But first, we have to turn those into uh, z values so that we can look things up in the z table. Um, at 90, uh, the z value is 90 minus 100 over 10, or in other words, negative 1. And we actually saw that value before, and the area was 0.3413. At the 110, we have 110 minus 100 over 10, and that works out to a z value of plus 1, um, which makes sense because we're talking about uh, values that are symmetric about the mean. The areas that we're interested in are non overlapping areas are about the mean, but they're the same size. Um, so it's um, 0 to negative 1 on one side, 0.3413, and 0.3413 on the other side. The answer to the question, what percentage of the population will have IQs ranging from 90 to 110? You have to add those two probabilities up. Um, and when you take 0.3413 plus 0.3413, you get 68.6826. But of course, the question asked about percentages and to turn from a probability, which is a proportion, and convert to a percentage, all you do is multiply by 100%. And the answer to part A is 68.26%. Part B of the problem is very much the same, uh, but the uh, two pieces, uh, the two non-overlapping areas on either side of the mean um, are a little larger. That's really all it is. Um, at an IQ of 80, uh, the Z value ends up being negative 2. At an IQ of 120, uh, the Z value ends up being plus 2. Um, the area under the curve, looking at the table, the Z table between 0 and 2 is 0 0.4772. So since the uh, normal distribution is symmetric around the mean, that's 0 0.4772 on the right side, 0 0.4772 on the left side. Uh, add those pieces together, you end up with a really big number, 0.9544. So uh, in this particular example, with this particular mean and standard deviation, 95.44% of the population will have IQs between 80 and 120. In this example, we're looking at the salary of automobile mechanics. Suppose we know it's normally distributed with a population mean of $40,000 and a population standard deviation of 10000 So question A asks, what proportion of auto mechanics will earn 24800 or less? B asks, what proportion of auto mechanics will earn 53500 or more? C is, what proportion of auto mechanics will earn between 45000 and 57000 D will ask, is asking for the 80th percentile. And finally, E asks for the 27th percentile. We're going to use, since we know it's normally distributed, we can use the Z table. Part A was, what proportion of auto mechanics will earn 24,800 or less? Okay, so you see the diagram. Always draw the picture. You've been told this several times. Okay, we want to know that it's called the left tail. See the way it is? It's the left tail. Now, the table only tells us 0 to Z. Okay, so we took the 40,000. That's going to be a 0 using the conversion. It's always going to be 0. Okay, now what is 24,800 in Z value? So the formula you're going to use, you see it there, X minus mu over sigma. So it's 24,000 minus 40,000 over 10,000 or minus 1.52. This is just saying that 
24,800 is minus 1.52 standard deviations away from 40,000. Now you can use the z-table and look up one, minus 1.52. Now 1.52 doesn't matter whether it's a plus or a minus, it's symmetric. Okay, so we go from 0 to 1.52. By now you know how to read the z-table, and you'll find the area is 0.4357. So the area from 0 to minus 1.52 is 0.4357, or $40,000, now we're in x values, 40,000 to 24,800 is the same as 0 to minus 1.52 standard deviations. And we know that area is 0.4357. But we know that the entire left, from the, if you go left of 0, is half. And from 0 to plus infinity is half. All right, so you take half minus 0.4357, and then you get the answer in that left tail. Let's call it the left tail. The answer is. 0.0643, or 6.43% of auto mechanics are going to earn less than 24,800. Okay, B asked, what proportion of auto mechanics are going to earn 53,500 or more? That's a right tail problem. Okay, always remember this half and half, so that zero cuts the normal distribution. Half on the right, half on the left. Always keep that in mind. You can even write 0 0.500 and 0 0.50000 on the left. Just to remind yourself. Okay, now we want to get from 53,500. Remember, it's 0 to Z. So 40,000 to 53,500. Well, that's the same as 0 to plus 1.35 on Z, in Z value. Converting the X to Z values. So 53,500. Is a z value of plus 1.35. How do I get that? You take 53,500 minus the mean of 40,000, divide by 10,000, and then you get that value of plus 1.35. Now the table is always zero to something. So from zero to plus 1.35, using the z table, we find that the area is 0.4115. Okay, now we need the right tail. But remember, the entire from zero to infinity is 0 0.5000. Subtract 0.4115 from 0 0.500, and then you get the answer in the right tail, which is 0 0.0885. So the answer to the question is 8.85% of auto mechanics will earn 53,500 or more. This is, this is the hardest problem to solve, and if you don't draw a picture, you're not going to get it right. The question asks, what proportion of auto mechanics are going to earn between 45,000 and 57,000? Now remember the way the table works. It's zero to Z. You're always, zero is like the base. Okay, so we want to turn everything into uh, Z values. Okay, so the 40, as you know, becomes zero. The middle, the mean is zero. This the Z table has a mean of zero, so that you just turn the 40,000 into zero. The 45,000 becomes a 0.5. It's five, half a standard deviation away in uh, standard deviation units. Okay, how do you know? 45,000 minus 40, that's X minus mu over sigma, and you get 0.5. 57,000 turns into a Z score of 1.7. How do you know? 57,000 minus 40,000 over 10,000, that's 1.70. Now you can't get that area between 0.5 and 1.7 directly. So what you got to do is you do 0 to 1.7, looking at the table, and you get the bigger piece, which is 0.4554. Now you subtract, you see it's in red there, it's high, the lines are in red. Now you take the smaller piece, okay, to get that red area. The smaller piece is 0 to 0.5. So we take the 0 to 0.5, which is 0 0.1915. Okay, so now you have basically two pieces. To get that in red, the one you want, you take the big piece, 0 0.4554, subtract the smaller piece, 0 0.1915, and what's left, what's left is going to be the answer to the question between 45 and 57,000. So the answer turns out to be 0 0.2639. 
Again, there's no way to do this without having the picture and you kind of highlight what you're looking for and you notice you need the big piece minus the small piece and you get that the, the, the area between 0.5 and 1.7. This is the most difficult question and it's not that difficult if you draw on the diagram. Uh, some normal distribution problems um, are in terms of percentiles. Parts D and E of this example ask you to compute percentiles of this distribution. You, you th it sounds uh, complicated. You may get a little nervous, but there's really nothing to stress out about. You already know how to do this. Um, what's the 50th percentile uh, in a normal distribution? That's the mean. In the Z distribution, that means that we have a Z score of zero. Um, if you're if you take a standardized exam and you're at the 50 percent mark for the 50th percentile mark, that means you have scored at the median and the mean and the mode if the uh, test scores are normally distributed because as we know in a normal distribution the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Let's look at how we can get other percentiles using the Z table. D is asking us to calculate the 80th percentile. Remember what a percentile is. The 80th percentile is that value of the distribution for which 80% of the values are smaller, 20% are larger. So we split the distribution, as you can see from the picture, on the right side, 80% um, are smaller, 20% larger. How does that 80% break down? Well, remember the um, at the mean, uh, which in this case is $40,000, Everything to the left of the mean is half of the distribution. Um, 0. 0.5000 000 plus 0. 0.3 gives you 0. 0.8. Uh, that's the 80th percentile. Um, so just take a, take a minute, um, draw your picture, make sure you understand how everything fits together. Now we know, if we know the percentile, we know the area under the curve. We're gonna be using our Z table um, kind of backwards, in reverse of the way we used it before. The Z table we've been using and that we're going to continue using as examples um, in these lectures is the zero to Z table where for any Z value you have an area under the curve between the mean and it. Um, but in this case we want to, to know we need the Z value. We want to know what's the Z value for the 80th percentile. We know the area under the curve. And you can see from the picture, the area under the curve, which would be the blue shaded area displayed on the table, is 0 0.3, 0 0.3000. 000. Um, so we're using the table backwards. And what we're actually doing is sort of mucking around in the middle and finding the area, the probability closest to 0 0.3000. 000. And when we do that, we find that the Z value associated with it is uh, 0.84, 0 0.8 in the row heading, 0.04 in the column heading. So we have a Z value of 0.84. That's not the complete answer yet, because what we wanted to know is the 80th percentile of the X's, of the salary of mechanics. Um, but then, but that's just simple algebra uh, in step four. If we know Z, which is 0.84, and we know mu, and we know sigma, we just plug all those values in and solve for X using simple algebra, and we end up with um, an X value at the 80th percentile of $48,400. Does that, first of all, take a look at the picture and just make sure it's on the correct side of the distribution, a very quick check. We're supposed to be on the right side and 48,000 is higher than 40,000, so yes. All right, so you know, at, least, at least we see we didn't make a gross error. Uh, that's the answer. The 80th percentile of this distribution is $48,400. Okay, now we want to calculate the 27th percentile. First, we have to find a z-score that's associated with the 27th percentile. Every z-score is associated with some kind of percentile. 
Okay, so which z-score is associated with the 20th, 7th percentile? So look at the diagram. You always draw this. And you can figure out that roughly 23% of the area is between 0 and minus 0.61. Right? You can see that. We have the z-table for you. And um, so the area between 0 and 0.61 or minus 0.61 is 0.2291, which are rounding to 23%. So that means a z-score of point, a negative 0.61 is associated with a 27 percentile. Bear in mind that any percentile below 50% has a negative z-score. A zero, as you know, is the 50th percentile. A z-score of zero at the 50th percentile. If you're below the 50th percentile, it's got to be negative. So in this case, we know it's going to be a negative number. It turns out that it's minus 0.61. And now just do the algebra. Minus 0.61 equals x minus 40,000 over 10,000. That's the x minus b over sigma we've been using. And then when you solve it, you'll see the answer is 33,900. That's x. And as a check, notice you're below the 40,000. 40,000 would put you at the 50th percentile. 33,900 is the 27th percentile. This is the way to solve it. If you have access to a cumulative z table, and uh, I think it's available. We think we provide it if you want it. If you have access to it, you can get the answer directly. You can look up, you know, any kind of percentile, and uh, from the uh, actually any kind of z-score. From any z-score, you can get a percentile. Now, if you know that you're below 50, you look for the negative cumulative, and you'll see. Uh, you'll look at the table, and you'll try to connect the uh, z-score with the 27th percentile, and you'll get the answer directly. Okay, if, if it's a value that's a positive uh, z-score, then we know that it's uh, above the 50th percentile. So that's another way to do it. We're doing it this way because many times you don't have access to that, to the cumulative. Remember, you'll see there's negative z-scores and positive z-scores if you're using the cumulative table. Always practice, practice, practice. Uh, you will learn this material much better if you do many, many problems, the more problems you do, the better, the easier, the faster it's going to be for you to complete the problems and get them correct.